<laughs> but greetings, everyone. My name is Heather Bryant, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the UNEG National Evaluation Capacities Development Working Group to this evaluation practice exchange on how to support national evaluation capacities and systems, lessons and way forward for UNEG. So I'm an evaluation advisor at the UNDP Independent Evaluation Office, as well as a member of the Global Evaluation Initiative Global Team. And I'm also one of the, the coordinators of this, this working group. So today we're going to do a group presentation, um, not by the entire working group, but for members of the group. So with me today are Renata Mirula from FAO and Eval Forward, who, and Renata is also the core co-coordinator of, of this working group. And we have Ricardo Polastro, who is a regional evaluation advisor for Latin America and the Caribbean in UNICEF. And Rika Terbeck Swane, who is an evaluation officer at WFP. And I'm hoping that we have other members of the working group here, but I don't see the list at the moment. So we have a lot to share with you today, but we are going to try to keep our presentation to about 25 minutes so that then we can leave the, the second half of our hour together to do questions or, or sharing from your side. So we'll go straight through to the end before taking questions, but feel free to go ahead and post questions or reflections as, as the ideas arise for you, and then we'll, we'll take them up in the end. So just to get started, let's go for a very small poll here. Jan, could you pull up the poll? Great, so we just have two questions. Have you heard of General Assembly Resolution 69 237? Yes or no? And then if yes, has the resolution influ influenced your or your agency's work? Okay, now we see some, some results coming on. Okay, this is, this is quite interesting. We're sort of so far, well, it kind of keeps, I was gonna say half, half, now it's sort of a 60, 40 in terms of people who have heard of the resolution and people who haven't. Um, and we do see that it has helped reinforce some of the work that we're already doing, but then other work is not so aware of this. So this is already a very interesting, interesting point. Um, one of the things that came out of the study that we did that we'll share with you in a moment is that actually most people interviewed at the country level hadn't heard of this resolution. So it would be interesting to see later if those of you who have heard of it are maybe in the, the central evaluation units and those of you that haven't maybe are, are, not, are, in, are in different units, but we can come back to that. So I just want to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today so that as we go through the presentation, you'll sort of hopefully understand sort of the path that we're taking. So we will talk a little bit about some history of national evaluation capacity development and, and we'll come back to the GA resolution. We'll have an introduction to our working group and the study that we've conducted this year. We'll tell you about our working definition of national evaluation capacity development, as well as the theory of change we developed. And we'll also share some information on what UN agencies have been doing to date to support NECD. And out of that, some of the lessons that have emerged from the studies for national evaluation systems, but also for UNIC in particular. And then we'll close with some of the recommendations that are emerging from this study, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. So first, a little bit of history. This UNEG working group is relatively new, but UN work on supporting national evaluation capacity development is not. In fact, we could even go back to the past century if we wanted. But in the work we've been doing this year, we started by looking back about 15 years to 2004, where there was an, an evalu a resolution, which here I'm quoting in part, strongly encouraged country level evaluations of the UNDAF and emphasized that national governments have primary responsibility for coordinating external assistance, including assistance from the UN, and evaluating the impact of this assistance and its contribution to national priorities. Then in 2005, we have the Paris Declaration, which as you all know, emphasizes country ownership. 
2006 sees the first UN evaluation policies being prepared, some of which also refer to support to national evaluation capacities from, from their first edition. A few years later, we had the first NEC conference. Then in 2012, a UNEG NEC-D task force developed practical tips on how to strengthen national evaluation systems which then brought us to 2014 and GA Resolution 69237. And this in fact was the first standalone resolution on evaluation capacities and calls upon entities of the UN development system to strengthen the capacity of member states for evaluation. So this is, this is an important landmark for the UN in terms of evaluation capacity development support. So following this moment in December 2014, we have 2015, which was declared the International Year of Evaluation, and which of course was also the year that the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was adopted. Moving on to 2016, as you probably know, that's the year that UNEG revised its norms and standards and added a new norm on national evaluation capacity development. By 2019, interest from UNEG in national evaluation capacity development was again sparked and an interest group was created, which then transformed mid 2020 into the present working group, which brings us to 2021 and the work that the group has been doing this year, which forms the basis for the next part of the presentation. Thanks Heather for Thanks, Heather, for taking us through this timeline. And uh, yes, uh, going back for a moment to the interest group, when it was formed in 2019, uh, we basically uh, shared a lot of knowledge and uh, our experiences and lessons around NECD. And it became quite clear that we uh, were needing in need of a definition and a common understanding on what we mean uh, as UN, uh, for uh, NECD from UNE. Uh, members are from and from UNIC side. Uh, so when we become uh, a, a working group in 2020, uh, the AGM made this decision also based uh, on the fact that there was a renewed interest and some member states were uh, coming together to propose a new resolution uh, on national evaluation uh, capacity development. So the AGM requested us as a working group at this time to uh, develop a study to identify progress since the resolution that Heather has mentioned. Uh, so we, uh, in parallel, we commissioned a study uh, with uh, some external consultants and uh, uh, the, the study looked both at UNEC perspectives, so interviewing UNEC heads and doing a survey to uh, all UNEC members, and also uh, developed six case studies uh, in countries to really look at what the entry points for UNEG uh, support to, uh, uh, to uh, countries and developing their national evaluation systems was. Uh, so in parallel to developing uh, the, the report, we as a group uh, came together to work on a theory of change on, and on a definition of NECD that you'll hear more about in a few moments. Uh, so just to show you uh, uh, what were the case studies we looked into. So next slide, thanks. Uh, so we developed six case studies in uh, countries where uh, starting for, from selecting from those where we had some uh, uh, UNEG interventions. Some, uh, uh, some of UNEG members have uh, put efforts in developing national evaluation capacities. Uh, so Costa Rica, Morocco, Benin, Kenya, Sri Lanka, and Philippines, so uh, across all continents. And this is uh, made a substantive part of what are the lessons that are emerging from our report. Uh, so just uh, briefly uh, to see who is in this working group, um, yes, next slide, we have 11 uh, agencies at different levels of uh, understanding and the development of practice on any city. Uh, so now I'll hand over to uh, Rika yeah. to take us through some of the building blocks of our work. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Renata. Yeah, so as Renata said, we started by uh, 
defining what NECD means and um, this is what we came up with. So NECD is the process whereby state and non-state entities and individuals, so basically not only governments, but also others, expand, reinforce and sustain national capacity to manage, produce and use evaluation. We also, um, it's, we also said it needs to be linked to national priorities, of course, should be um, country led. It aims at strengthening governance through accountability and learning like all evaluations um, are supposed to do. And then, um, at the, like it focuses on the outcomes of greater demand for evaluation, better quality of evaluations and their use in policy and practice. And we also said that this is achieved through three dimensions, uh, the national evaluation system. So firstly, the individual skills and knowledge, secondly, institutional systems and policies, and thirdly, an enabling environment, which also includes actually um, evaluation culture or the tone at the top. And um, the, actually, the definition goes on a bit, but we um, want to keep it a bit short to also discuss other things uh, in this session. So I'd like to move on. Yeah, so um, this is now the theory of change. So once we had the definition, we thought about how does NECD work and also like why do we do NECD? So what are the objectives um, of NECD actually? So we, um, so we said that um, or our our assumption is that if um, not a state and non-state actors have the capacity to produce and um, commission and use evaluation, then they can use evaluative ed evidence um, in decision making, and that leads to, of course, uh, better programs and um, yeah, achievement of the SDGs and national development uh, objectives. So, but what does that mean? I mean, how do we get there? Of course, um, now we look at what is required from the national evaluation system. And uh, there are a few um, elements. Of course, what is needed is the enabling environment, including a, like an appropriate regulatory framework and a, an evaluation policy. Then it's important that there's demand, like public institutions demand evaluations, which also means, of course, they understand what uh, evaluation is and what, um, yeah, what the benefits and added value of evaluation are requires an appropriate institutional uh, framework, including uh, also resources and uh, processes in place. Uh, it uh, requires individual capacities uh, to manage and also produce uh, evaluative evaluations. And we also said that uh, it's important that they are, you know, in the wider ecosystem of evaluation, there's not only the government, but also non-public sector organizations that um, can demand evaluations, but also offer evaluation capacity development services. And finally, um, what is important in this in enabling environment is also that there's kind of a possibility for exchange or a platform where all of these different actors can exchange. And as I mentioned earlier, I mean, this is um, here you see very, very clearly also in this uh, theory of change that the three dimensions, enabling environment, institutional capacities, and individual capacity. And then, yeah, so now is the question, what can we, we as UNEC members do to support these national evaluation uh, systems or strengthen those? And I don't want to talk about this here. I mean, that's, of course, the bottom of the um, theory of change because we have additional slides on, on examples later. But one thing that is important to mention here is this very small gray um, box that can easily be forgotten. That's the coordination about UNEC members. And it came up very clearly in the study, and uh, in particular, the, the case studies on, on the Philippines and Kenya, that, um, I mean, that NECD does not work if it's just fragmented initiatives. It really needs to be coordinated and, and uh, planned strategically uh, between the agencies and, of course, led by uh, countries themselves. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So, um, yeah, as Renata mentioned, we have, um, Conduct so I mean we have conducted this the survey market and agencies um, bringing up again the question what can be done to strengthen the national evaluation systems. So we asked basically what agencies have done to implement the 2014 resolute uh, on NECD, and we received responses from 14 out of the 51 agencies that we uh, reached out to, and we tried in this. Graph, it speaks a bit to itself, I guess, but we try to link it in color wise, <laughs> at least to the um, theory of change. So you can see on the top, the individual capacity development is in blue. Then the yellow um, is um, the enabling environment. The red or purple is the 
institutional um, uh, um, uh, capacities. And on the bottom, you actually see that um, these are elements related to non-state actors, this other, other group that you see. And you see some initiatives, of course, like evolution champions, like creating evolution champions or understanding uh, the role of evidence and so on is, is kind of, you know, can be mixed uh, between the different uh, types or categories. But what you can see, more, I mean, the easiest or, or what most agencies do is individual capacity development, 12 out of 14 responses were received. And uh, then, um, yeah, but very little comparatively, like only three agencies work on uh, the product, production of evaluations by non-public institutions. Yeah, so that just gives you an overview. And I would like to also, next slide, please. If just an example from um, WFP, so, um, so you have just some illustration of what can be done concretely in terms of NECD initiatives. And I'm linking that also to the theory of change. So firstly, we have the diagnostics. We have um, uh, in, the, in Latin America established the National Evaluation Capacity Index in, in co uh, cooperation with DEVAL and other partners. And we also conducted a mapping of national evaluation capacities in East Africa. And we believe that in addition to showing kind of the, the strengths and weaknesses of, of uh, national evaluation systems, one important outcome of such initiatives is really to bring governments around the table and have them start a discussion about like what can be improved uh, in their system, how it can be done. Then secondly, um, at the level of um, yeah, systems and, and tools, or let's say, I think it's, it's maybe as a kind of, it's a, a bit between the enabling environment and the institutional capacity. We work um, with the Indian uh, government on evaluation policy and tools. And then also we work on m and &E frameworks in Tunisia and Minnesota, for example. And these, I think, can be really considered like foundations of um, national evaluation systems. So very important initiatives. And then thirdly, um, WFP is involved in advocacy with two, um, let's say, with, with yeah, with two um, agendas, let's say, in mind. So first, we work on, or we advocate for evaluation news for decision making, you know, through workshops and, and seminars and so on. And we also um, work specifically towards uh, promotion of country-led evaluation. So we are part of uh, a work. That consists of several partners that um, support the Nigerian government in in gaining support for a new UN resolution specifically on country-led evaluations that complements the 2014 resolution. And yeah, we have two more things, but I think in the interest of time, I would rather move on. Yeah, we also um, support you know training and tools, and we support uh, governments directly on evaluations through support of government-led evaluations and joint evaluations um, conducted together with governments. Um, yeah, but I would like to hand over to Ricardo so that he can tell us a bit more about what UNICEF is doing. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Rika, for, for, for outlining the WFP examples. We've, we've engaged a lot on policies on systems throughout the different regions, the seven regions where we operate. Uh, either through uh, national societies or uh, evaluation, uh, regional constituencies such as VOPES, but also through the national government and local government. Now, we do use a series of evaluations also a little bit as spearheads, either a country program evaluation, which are compulsory in our uh, revised evaluation policy of 2018. We've got some examples here from the region, but this is throughout the world so that you get a sense, but also in thematic evaluations in our uh, education areas, in our ECD work, uh, in our uh, work on health, on nutrition, on emergency. We also have regional multi-country evaluations. Um, and some examples here in this region, we've done uh, violence against children, which has led to national policies, and then we develop monitoring and evaluation frameworks which are then monitored together with the national government, both at national level and subnational level. This uh, specific uh, evaluation was conducted in 15 countries in the Latin America and the Caribbean region. 
Um, other examples of country-led evaluations, we have some examples. I mean, the other day uh, we were presenting with the government of Brazil, the Ministry of Economy, on uh, the biggest, the largest cash transfer of the world, the Bolsa Familia, where we supported a cost-effectiveness study. Uh, so we're part, we're doing joint initiatives, but already the national government has very strong frameworks. In this region, you have state-of-the-art, uh, I would say, government's capacity. You take examples such as uh, the Chiles, the, the, the uh, Colombias, or you take the Costa Ricas or the Mexicos. You already have a very strong institutional setup where national policies, national plans, uh, which development partners support are regularly evaluated. Uh, there, there, there are a number of examples in the other region, but I would like to cite also other countries which are in the lead in our examples, such as South Africa, which is quite interesting and where we engaged back in 2011, as you will see in, uh, in the, uh, the study itself. But we've also done some uh, joint initiatives, and this goes back to the diagnostics we did in uh, East Asia and the Pacific, where we did nine country offices, uh, nine countries diagnostic, looking at the national evaluation capacities and national evaluation systems to evaluate the SDGs. This, uh, this actually uh, led to roadmaps together with all the development partners, all the UN country teams. Uh, all the, the, the private sector, but also civil society organizations. And how could we support the national government uh, evaluate the, the SDGs? One example was the, the Malaysia workshop back in the days in East Asia and the Pacific. Um, next, please. Uh, let, me, let me just a little bit zoom out from uh, specific examples, agency examples, and go back to, to, to the study, which used a similar framework uh, to the one that we had for the East Asia and the Pacific case studies. But first of all, national uh, evaluation systems and national evaluation capacity is not a short-term goal. It's a long-term one. It takes at least, uh, we could say, 10 to 20 years. And if we look into uh, the, the Mandela presidency, where he decided to create the evaluation function within the presidency office, or if you look at the example of Coneval back in the days where the prime minister, where the prime minister and the uh, president came from two different parties, and the president demanded for accountability of the uh, prime minister office. So, and wanted to see what results were being achieved by the government. So that is institutional setup, it's systems which do take time. Um, the, other, the other element is that all development partners should work together to uh, contribute to this. It does not make sense to have like a, a millennium development goals set up with one agency that pursues one SDG. You have to work around the different SDGs, and it is a governance function. Evaluation is a governance function, first of all. So we need to look at how do we support this, and we have to move out of the project kind of base and build into national ownership, national systems, which do take time to establish. Having a policy is not sufficient on evaluation. Then you need to have the funds for evaluation. And it's not a supply-driven mode where the UN agencies just are evaluating their interventions. If you're supporting a national development policy, say as an institution, you would like the national government to evaluate to what extent that policy is being implemented. That's your interest. So you need to move out the supply-driven kind of dimension. And that's a little bit following the Paris Declaration, which Heather referred to, which is of 2005. We really need to pull up our socks as a whole system and have the national governments and support the national governments evaluate. That means that we need to understand where are these systems, at what degree of maturity these systems are. Some are highly developed where we could see our tiny contribution to these results, while others are in the making. 
So as a collective throughout UNIC, we need to work on how do we support, how do we understand, first of all, these systems? So it's really important to have a common definition and a common approach towards strengthening these. And secondly, uh, how do we work together also with other development partners, say regional development banks or the World Bank, which have worked on national evaluation systems since the 90s? The other dimension is having an evaluation policy in place. It is critical. Without a policy, uh, it's very difficult to put in place. You'll just get project level evaluations. That that will be that will be an issue. Uh, but beyond the policy, you need an evaluation plan. Uh, you need uh, uh, you need also an evaluation budget, which needs to be in place which needs to be in place. Uh, and uh, you want also to have uh, political evaluation champions uh, uh, and support uh, the, the evaluation champions. You want allies and these allies means that we approach them. They could be in ministries of finance, ministries of planning, the prime minister's office, even the presidency office. And they need to see the results of evaluation. Evaluation needs to move out of a ritualistic box taking kind of exercise into a transformative one where it helps implement the policy, but also see what results it is achieving. VOPEs in some countries really play a catalytical role. So we can't just go through national government channels. We need also to work with the voluntary organizations on the ground. And so you've seen some, some, some of the meetings that we've had in the past, we're just concentrating uh, the, the national governments, be the Ministry of Planning or the Ministry of Finance. You need to have also on the ground, the voluntary organizations, the ones that do the legwork within the countries, which could work towards training national officials. And then also you need to be, we need to move out of a supply-driven kind of mode where everything comes from the agencies. There needs to be a national investment in evaluation. So when, when we are advising, and we are working with the national governments, we need to help them develop not only a policy, not only the systems, but have funds in place to then evaluate. And that is, is, is really critical. And it's not just the budgets of our projects, our programs, uh, or our headquarters fund. So it's really important that we create that capacity on the ground to invest, and they see a value for money in it. And this is reflected not only in the policies, but is reflected also in the national budget. Next, please. Uh, the, there are some key lessons from, uh, for, for the UNIC members here. First of all, you want to implement uh, evaluation in a development way. That means you've got an evaluator that works as a facilitator, but through the facilitation builds the capacity of the different stakeholders, builds the ownership and the national capacity. The other dimension is also working on country-led evaluations. It's, it's really important to use the existing national government systems, but also using the existing processes. You can't work against these. And the other day we were having a deep dive with the government of Peru, which was saying, you know, we have national development frameworks, uh, but all the different development actors are using their own systems, their own results, their own indicators. So you need to align to that and you need to support this kind of process. Otherwise you lead to fragmentation. If everybody intervenes on a project base, if everybody intervenes with their own unit of analysis, with their own systems, you're not contributing to national ownership. You're not contributing to national development. You're actually, uh, undermining it. So you really need to shift the equation. A key factor in that is the proportion of ODA to the GDP. If you're in a context like in Afghanistan, where 70% of the GDP depends on ODA, 
on overseas development aid, obviously you're gonna have this kind of fragmentation. But as you progressively diminish that, and when there's an increasing national development budget, uh, which invests both on social and economic targets, that has to have a, uh, a niche. And, and, and you have to work not only through the evaluation units, you need to engage all the governance there. Uh, you need to move also way out of the fragmentation approach. And that means that we have a joint approach towards uh, strengthening national capacities because otherwise we're gonna work against each other. And in the past where national evaluation capacity development has failed, especially in the 90s, is when each agency, each donor had a different approach towards it. So it's really important to work as a collective. And uh, what we see also in national evaluation capacity, it's a very strong basis for joint programming. Over to you. And sorry for the background noise. Thanks, Ricardo. Uh, so in the interest of time, we, I'll go quite quickly on this, but this is uh, um, our emerging recommendations from uh, the lessons that Ricardo shared. So just I'll go through the first set, Heather, if you could. Go. Yeah, so Ricardo has mentioned how it is important to uh, conduct our own evaluations in a developmental way, in a way that builds capacity. So uh, what the recommendations that come out from our study and our report is, first of all, uh, at a minimum, strengthen the capacity of local evaluators by engaging them in our evaluations, especially young and emerging evaluators. And agencies are already doing this, uh, including uh, hiring a growing number of uh, local consultants. Uh, then include national governments in evaluation management structures in a leading role. And this also links to jo joint and country-led evaluations. We saw that country-led evaluations is a, a concept that often is misused. Uh, country-led means really country uh, having a leadership role in the evaluation and uh, the UN as a, a more as a facilitator and a, as a support role, but not making decision. So there are examples also of uh, these uh, um, joint evaluations by WFP and other agencies and uh, also country-led evaluations. We had an example uh, even back in the past, uh, uh, UNDAF, the first UNDAF evaluation in South Africa was a joint evaluation with the uh, involvement of um, government, strong involvement in gov of uh, the government counterparts. Um, support country-led government evaluations that address agencies' priorities, and but especially at C say at stress what Ricardo was mentioning, using national evaluation plans using country systems. Uh, there are many countries that have among our country case studies in this report, Costa Rica was the one that had the most advanced uh, national evaluation agenda, but there are many others, as uh, Ricardo has mentioned. Uh, so using their own, uh, the, the country evaluations is a really um, uh, a way to really build those capacity and really uh, give ownership and, uh, and um, ownership to the countries in their evaluation undertakings. Uh, I'll just hand over to Rika. If I'm not mistaken, oh, no, to Heather, sorry. <laughs> Heather. <laughs> sorry. Over, Renata. In fact, just to, to let you know what's happening here, we have three overarching recommendations with kind of these sub recommendations. So the first one that Renata was talking about is really about how we as UN agencies do our evaluations and how we could do them in a way that supports national evaluation capacity development. And the second recommendation is really about UN agencies continuing to support more directly national evaluation systems at all three levels that Rika mentioned, the enabling environment, institutional and individual capacities. So I'm not going to repeat all of these. I had several other examples I was going to pull up, but I think Ricardo has given us a, a great set of examples. So I'm just gonna go straight to the last bullet point on the slide because I think we haven't discussed this quite as much. Um, the study really points to, to the idea that UN evaluation units and UN agencies are particularly well positioned 
when supporting both evaluations, individual evaluations, but in building national evaluation systems to look at integrating things like the SDGs, gender equality, human rights, disability inclusion, and other leave no one behind perspectives, as well as climate change issues, again, in not only evaluations, but the evaluation systems. And this is already happening. I'll just cite a couple of examples um, that were picked up by the study and that you'll be able you'll be able to read many more when the report comes out. UN Women, for example, provided assistance in Sri Lanka for evaluating SDGs with an equity focused and gender responsive lens. And then in Costa Rica, they provided methodological support through the elaboration of a guide for the evaluation of programs and projects with a gender, human rights, and interculturality perspective, a regional product that was developed with the participation of the Costa Rican National Institute of Women and Mouvement And just to bring in another agency that we haven't talked about, ILO shared that having a specific SDG, in their case, SDG 8, that they were responsible for and then bringing it down to the level of national reporting triggered requests for support from their natural their national constituents and then they were also able to make a push for evaluation so like i said there's many more evaluations in the report but again that one of the, the comparative advantages of our of us as the un system is really integrating these elements into a system that might otherwise take things from just a more technical perspective. And with that, over to the third recommendation, Enrique. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, so the third recommendation is about the gray box uh, at the bottom of the theory of change. Um, yeah, I mean, about collaboration and, and, and coordination, but of course also about allocating adequate times and, and resources. So um, just to make sure that LECD doesn't fall through the cracks uh, when there are other evaluation priorities, which are usually many, of course, um, in the, the work plans of busy evaluation functions. So yeah, I mean, the, the sub-recommendations are to include NECD in the in the evaluation policies and mandates. That's already happening in many agencies. If um, the, the study found that on the ground, actually many colleagues do not, do not are not aware or do not know, or it's also at national level. Um, it recommends to, to allocate at least 10% of the time and resources of an evaluation function to NECD. I think we can improve a lot on that, uh, probably. Uh, um, just an, an estimate. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mentioned already the gray box, and, but specifically um, at country level, uh, it's important that NECD is included in agency country programs and the UNSTCF and that efforts are coordinated and that there's a joint NECD program. So no fragmented uh, initiatives ad hoc from individual agencies, but rather a more strategic approach um, that's coordinated among the agencies and that is uh, most importantly country led and country driven. And I would like to hand back to Renata. Go, go ahead, Renata. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we would just wanted to give an overarching final message uh, that you can read on the slide. I'm conscious about time. Evaluation in the UN uh, should include the vision we have for our partner countries, that partner countries really do their own evaluations of their national programs and policies. And UNEG, we think it's well positioned to play a, a really a key role in this. But I'll hand over to Heather for our... Uh, concluding uh, questions and uh, the discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Renata. And thanks to Ricardo and Rika for, for, for all working together on this presentation. Um, we'd now like to hand over to all of you, our participants, and, and our sort of overarching question to you is, what could UNIG and our individual agencies do to further advance national evaluation capacity development in support of Agenda 2030? So I'm going to stop sharing the screen, but now we would really like to hear from you. Jenny, I see you have a hand up. Yes, I would like just to thank uh, a lot for this presentation. And I think these uh, recommendations are going to be very important, at least for our office. Because I think at the moment we are already, for example, working a lot with national consultants in our country program evaluation. 
We are also trying to establish a reference group, but it's very challenging. And as you said, it takes much more time than normal. I mean, the normal is because you, you need to create ownership of this process. And I think this is very important for the use we will do after this evaluation and the results, and also for the quality of the, of the evaluation. So I think it's also useful, this recommendation also because, I mean, for our management to accept the fact that the process will be longer, and also that we need resources to do this work. That's uh, another recommendation that is going to be very useful for our work. Also because as you said, at the end, the final vision would be to have national countries doing the evaluation of their own programs and policies. And uh, I can see that there is a lot of value of having like a UN agency doing a, like an evaluation in a developmental way with more ownership from government. But the next step is really to support them to do their own evaluation that I think this is their interest. I mean, when you talk to them in any case, I mean, their interest is more on their own programs and policies. So I think it's very useful, this set of recommendations, and it's really like uh, giving some direction for the way forward. Thanks for this work. Great, Jenny. Thank you so much for sharing some examples that really echo what's what's already been coming out of the study that we've been doing. I see a hand from Joaquin Salido. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, no, I, I echo the, the the interest on the recommendations and the added value that, that this report is bringing. We are really looking forward to see the 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 final uh, the 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 full the full report. Um, Quick reaction on what can we do or some steps for, for increase the, the national capacities on evaluation. I know that this might sound like a very basic step, uh, but it would help to have some sort of consolidate list of which are the evaluation, uh, the evaluation, I don't know how to call it, institutions in the different regions where, or countries where we operate, because some of us might be working with minist ministries of planning. Uh, of course, every single ministry has some sort of planning, uh, sorry, evaluating unit. Um, and maybe more advanced countries, they have even their own evaluation agency, um, or probably a combination of both. So maybe an initial step to coordinate our actions is to have a clear mapping of which are the key evaluation institutions in the countries where we operate. It's something that I know is hard to make. It's not something that we are going to make in, in, in one week, uh, and it will bring a lot of work. But uh, maybe something that uh, can be a first step to, to align, to identify who are the key, the key players in each country in evaluation. So yeah, over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for, for those comments and and um, and also that suggestion about mapping. I think there are a few exercises happening around it, something really quite important. Masa, I see you have a hand up. Okay. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, uh, session it's great uh, to hear this uh, I think it is one of the important work that we do uh, and I agree with a lot of things that have been said uh, how we conduct evaluations how we approach uh, to identify champions uh, picking up uh, something that Ricardo said uh, uh, maybe we should uh, organize uh, broader meetings with OEC DAC and then uh, uh, other IFIs and so on the strategy of aligning ourselves uh, towards national evaluation capacity development in evaluation uh, instead of just talking among ourselves. So that's one. The second is we always think about uh, NECD as uh, uh, government-led evaluations. And of course, uh, UNICEF have been a very active in uh, approaching uh, civil society. And I was wondering if, because uh, government, even if you create champions, uh, sometimes it comes and goes and the administration changes and they do the enthusiasm for evaluation. So if the society, if it is uh, uh, socially mature and willing to take over the role of examining the government policies towards SDGs, which is for their own benefit, uh, uh, 
that is another uh, route in which we can also approach and try to uh, encourage and strengthen. And this would require a lot of different uh, programs and uh, uh, thinking, but we can support those uh, structures. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Um, Ricardo, you have your hand up. Did you want to maybe answer one of the questions in the chat? Uh, I wanted actually to come back on a couple of points before moving into the chat. Uh, first of all, on the repository uh, that uh, Joaquin was suggesting, I think from a knowledge management perspective, it's really important to have. We did that in UNICEF, we conducted a mapping. I think it would be good together that all the key agencies in UNIC working on uh, national evaluation capacity development put that mapping together. That's, that's the first point. Secondly, uh, going on the different partners in which we operate. I think it's really important to have a strategy around NECD within UNEC. Our different agencies, some of us do have a strategy, some of us don't. Some of us have a collection of initiatives, but I do think it's really important that collectively we put our heads together on what are the four areas. And this working group, what has been understanding, just to answer Masa's point is putting together a definition has taken a lot of time, putting together a theory of change where there were so different understandings of what NECD was. Just on that individual organizational dimension was so diverse. And so first of all, the focus I think is essential. Then I think the mapping and then maybe the core actions we want to carry out is necessary. And now moving to, 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 to the chat, uh, I, I'll take just uh, maybe one question. Uh, which one would you like me to take, Heather? Um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble scrolling back up through the, <laughs> the chat. My mouse has gone on me. So if you can just stab at your, take one yourself or if Renata, if you could help us out. Uh, is this the independence? Shall I take the independence one of uh, Eduardo? Sure, that's a good idea because I was actually going to turn to you, Andrika, as, as agencies that have experience okay. with this. It's a really good question about the managing independence um, with respect to a joint evaluation. Okay, so both on the joint and the country led, uh, there is a dimension, first of all, that you want to build, uh, depending also. Uh, You'll, you'll need to see what kind of evaluation practice there is at the country level. You know, some countries, at least in the region where I am now, where there are a lot of middle high income countries, uh, have a very independent evaluation organ, which uh, is either sits uh, in the presidency or in the prime minister office or is an independent body. That's, that's one thing. But there are some cases where you don't have that, say in a number of low income countries or lower middle income countries. And there what you do is organize reference groups. Uh, you do set up that and you campaign the process. Uh, and that independence is progressively carved out because what they need to understand is to establish a little bit of evaluation practice. Now, if you move it and you front load it fully on independence from the start, the risk is that you will not create a self-learning environment, which is, let's say, the first base if you are trying to set up national evaluation capacity. Uh, it should not be understood as a threat. It needs to be understood as a critical friend. And little by little, once you establish the practice within the country, and we're, we're moving a, along those 10, 20 years of the timeline we had in the lessons, little by little, you need to ring fence that independence, both from a functional perspective, but also from a budget perspective and from a system perspective. So progressively those mechanisms are established. And as a development partner, you're campaigning that uh, 
with a higher or a lower level of effort according to the degree of maturity of that independence and what you're trying to prioritize with your evaluation function. Over to you. Great, thank you, Ricardo. We're, we're getting very close to the hour and I know that many people probably have meetings scheduled immediately after this one. So I'd just like to very quickly um, thank Grace for reiterating the, the importance of the, the last recommendation, the one that Rika shared on, on working together. I, I, I agree fully on, on, on the need to work, that we work better when we're coordinated. Yeah. There's a question about, does the report talk about or any other assessment of how many current UNSCDFs include attention to national evaluation capacity development and how? I'm not aware of it. That's not something that we covered in the study, but it's a really interesting question and could be part of that mapping in terms of understanding who is doing what, doing a, perhaps a text mining of, of current UNSCDF um, Fs frameworks would, would be a, a way forward. Um, David from UNHCR has, has mentioned the diagnostic work um, carried about out about the, the CLEAR centers, which are, are now part of the, the global evaluation initiative. And there will be more and more resources there on the, on the GEI website. There's also a UNDP site, um, NEC, NEC UNDP org that has a National Evaluation Capacities Information Center that does include some information by country in terms of the main evaluation. If there is a central evaluation unit or entity heading um, evaluation in a given country, there may be, may be gaps, but it, it could be a place to start if you're, you're, if you're interested in information on that. Um, also, Jerry from FAO has also talked about the need for the UNSCDF and that the, the existing UN m &E groups could be a, a natural home for this. This is actually something we do touch on in the, in the report. So once that comes out, you'll, you'll be able to see more of that. Um, sorry, I'm just going through this really quickly. Um, Importance of strengthening capacity of national evaluators. Yes, exactly. And also the question of struggling to find national consultants. Um, good question, we'll, we'll park that one. <laughs> and David, yes, the recognizing that change isn't unidirectional. That's, you're absolutely right. And you'll see that that comes out in the report as well. And particularly in the country case studies where we see countries that, that took several steps forward and then due to contextual changes, sometimes political changes in the country, things do seem to take a few steps backwards and then, then we move again. Right, right, well, thank you. And Genta has, has added the link to the, the NEC Info Center in the chat. So we've hit three o'clock Europe time. So I'm just gonna hand over to Renata to kind of wrap up. But if there are people who are interested, I think some of us can stay on and just continue the chat informally. Renata? Okay, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to say that our working group would welcome new members that we aim as, as in the chat, there was a lot of exchange on uh, knowledge sharing and sharing of experiences and mapping. We aim to continue this work and to support this, this, this effort, which is very important. Uh, so we welcome new members, especially those from agencies that so far have not been engaged in uh, NECD because we really aim to facilitate facilitate sharing of knowledge and good practices and experiences and learning on this important uh, uh, area of work. Uh, so I, I think it's, uh, we reached the hour, so I'll just uh, thank everyone and thanks all for your interest and your uh, feedback. And the report, uh, as I said in the chat, will be presented at EG AGM in January, so we'll make it available uh, ahead of the AGM. Uh, thanks to all and be in touch for any other further comment or question. We'll be happy to liaise with you. Thanks and bye bye. <laughs> and thanks to Rika, Ricardo, Heather and all the working group members. <laughs>